Good afternoon and welcome to the meeting of the Family, Children and Custody Subcommittee of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. I want to welcome everyone and I'd like to start by taking a roll. Um, Bashan? Present. Hamilton? Present. McRae? Here. Olvera? Here. Sarush? Here. And uh, Judge Wiley uh, emailed me to let me know that she's going to be um, joining us a little bit late. She has a meeting. So uh, I want to first start by asking if there's anyone who wants to make public comment. If you'd like to make public comment, please um, use the Zoom function of hand raising to let us know. Um, I don't see anyone indicating that they want to make public comment. So um, I can just go ahead and start. Um, I just have one slide. I and I missed the meeting last week, but I understand there was a discussion about um, how to proceed in terms of the uh, custody and um, I mean the uh, guardianship and conservatorship issues. And the I think there was an initial meeting. Is this right, Leah? About our, from with our subject mess, uh, matter experts that are developing a list of uh, of topics and tasks akin to the one that's been done for family law. And that group is going to meet later this week again. And, and, and then we'll come back with some in, recommendations for your consideration. Is that accurate, Leah? Right. So I, I met with two of the subject matter experts last week and we hope to meet with all five of them this week um, and then bring that work product back to this group. Right. The next meeting. So for today, um, the, the two tasks that I think are before us is to go back and review the subtopics and tasks to make sure everything's been captured. And there's a couple of things that are still outstanding. And then also to develop the recommendation about in-court representation and have a discussion about that. Um, so if that, if you're in agreement about that, I can bring up the list of subtopics and tasks. Does that sound accurate to you? Okay, so let me go ahead and share that. Um, sorry, just gonna... Let's see. Hold on a second, I'm sorry, I'm having a little Zoom moment, let's see. Okay, so I incorporated the what, what was discussed last time, the, the, the revisions that were made. Um, so I don't know that we need to go through all of them, except for if we want to review to make sure that it's, it's still accurate. Um, and I highlighted a couple of things that I thought we should discuss. But do we want to just take it? I'll, I'll let you take a quick look to make sure I captured things accurately. I think, may I make a comment or? Yes. yes I was just uh, gonna uh, point out something regarding violence prevention. I mm -hmm. think that there was a question about whether uh, we should be asking paraprofessionals to take specialized training uh, education uh, regarding trauma-informed services, service delivery. And in the, the previous meeting or previous joint meeting, I had said that even though attorneys don't have to do that, I think that from a best practice perspective, and we, we now know a lot more than before and because what's at stake here, um, I think we should leave that in. And we're just every year more, there's more evidence um, that we are our system, the legal system, acknowledging the importance of such education, um, and there even there's been changes to the law to add even more to the law uh, to um, uh, 
because not in every county, for example, course of control was added to the law starting January as the type of conduct that can be prohibited and also can be the basis for issuance of a restraining order. And that's new. And uh, Santa Clara and Santa Clara, our judges were doing that anyway, but not in California. So that's like, there's all, you know, we're learning more and I think we shouldn't go back. We should go forward. So that's why um, I, I, I really hope that this stays in and that our group agrees to leave that in there. And then make efforts to make sure that the attorneys is added as a sub education requirement for attorneys too. Are you referring to this number two under here, this specific annual CLE? Um, domestic some... abuse, no, number one, domestic abuse violence education mandatory. Oh, I see. So you want to you want to say something specifically about trauma informed? No, trauma informed is fine. It was, there was a question of why should we put that in there when attorneys don't have to Okay. Do the same. Okay. If I'm so recalling correct, I'm okay, pretty sure, sure. This, that was said. Okay. And there's this, um, we discussed last time, a separate report from, made for actions other than DVPA and DVRO. And I just wanted to clarify what was meant by that. Were we, were we possibly saying take out non-family types of violence prevention orders and put that in a separate report? I don't. Yes, I think that's what you were saying, to bifurcate, um, not to, to carve out non-family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so would that go into, would, would the recommendation then that that would go back to general civil or when you're saying a separate report well, harassment gun violence and workplace violence right those need to be separated out i don't think to go to civil but we had we had to build them out right we, they're not built out yet what we're doing with guardianships and conservatorships now right we're acknowledging that they don't belong under the heading family they're under probate their own thing so this may be just violence prevention non-family perhaps we want to call it elder abuse is a lot of crossover with family because sometimes intimate partners husband wives they're older and they use elder abuse and sometimes it's a parent child mm -hmm. and siblings that go for that in qualifying cases but what, what I'm trying to clarify is whether we're going to request that the other um, subcommittees that are working on those practice areas will take those up, like the, the workplace violence and the elder abuse. I'm just wondering, or is it something that this group was going to take up later on, but not as part of this? I'm just not clear if it's going to be reported separately, who's taking that on in terms of what's going to be done. Well, we've done a lot of work on it. I, I don't remember. It's up to you. I mean, it's up, obviously not necessarily up to me, but I'm just thinking there's no need to do that as long as we acknowledge that this, you know, we're separating out of family, kind of like with conservatorship guardianship and giving us its own sort of category. It's this subcommittee, Linda, it's just not in this family law document. Okay, so it just won't, it'll be in a separate report. I, but for elder abuse, is there other thoughts on whether or not to include that in the family law piece or to carve it out? I thought you all felt it needed to be carved out at one point. I agree. And in our court, it's heard over in, not in family, it's heard by a different judge than DP. So I don't know what's happening in other counties. Steve, what's happening in your county with elder? Uh, these would all be within the, the, all of these, the civil harassment, the gun violence, the, el the elder abuse restraining order, not something that's in probate, and the workplace violence would all be heard by civil judicial officers that are not family law. So in a court where they segregate out the, the or separate out the different work responsibilities, to me, this is a separate, a separate category and it would be within the sub civil subcategory.
So you, should, you think it should be moved into that group? I think that group moved it into this one. Yeah. <laughs> I just said we've done a lot of work <laughs> yeah. on it, so. Yeah. All right, so for right now, I think we need to just take civil harassment, gun violence, workplace violence, and move them out of this document to another okay. document and add elder abuse into that other document. And then we have to figure out what we're gonna do with that. Okay, right. great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna again, just scroll down so you can quickly scan this to make sure that it's still accurate. Let me know when you're ready for me to scroll down further. <clears throat> Everybody ready for me to move on? I am. Uh, maybe I'll make a comment. It had been suggested by somebody not on this subgroup, I think it was Steve Fleischman, that, that we should look at monetary limits in terms of the property issues. And the consensus I have is from at least from the California Lawyers Association that that would not be appropriate. And we would have concerns about antitrust issues being raised. Okay. So it doesn't change anything, but just to give some feedback on that mm -hmm. suggestion that we'd received previously. I would also just add that he prefaced his remarks by trying to make us choose whether we are trying to set up a program that competes with attorneys. And I just think that's a false premise. This group that we're trying to provide some assistance to has a choice between no help at all and this new category. So I just would add that. Oops. Sorry. Okay, now let's see. Um, I'm good. Okay, and so I think that there are two categories that still need to be resolved. These, um, the child welfare, the issue of this investigation prior to the filing of a dependency action, this is a situation when counsel is not appointed. So this is prior to the appointment of, of uh, counsel in these cases. This is, I thought this was just to help uh, the parents get access to the report um, and sort of show them the way, not in any, not, not to contact the agency on their behalf or anything, but just provide information. I'm not sure why it's there in terms of formally allowing paraprofessionals to provide that assistance. Because I think it's mostly informational, you know, like here's what you do, here's who you contact versus, oh, I'm going to contact them for you. And I, I don't think the department will release those reports to anybody other than the non-parents, uh, than the parents without authorization. So, and then JV 180 is a very simple mm -hmm. judicial counsel form and it really is an access issue. And I think it's just so similar to family we help here with JB 180 and we don't touch anything else in the juvenile dependency realm, just so you know. Right. And just the reason why this was included is this is one of the things that came up in the justice gap study as an area that, that people, um, you know, dependency was raised and, and the discussion in the group was that overall dependency is not appropriate because they're court appointed counsel, except for this small category of these investigations. If someone might need assistance and, and guidance on how to work with the child welfare mm -hmm. department prior to the dependency case being filed. Mm -hmm. There are actually several areas where uh, appointed counsel has nothing to do with, and these are usually post 
action. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and the other areas are too complicated, like termination of a guardianship that was granted within a juvenile dependency action. This, <laughs> however, JB 180 is very simple and it does happen. So, but isn't that done only in the dependency case as opposed yeah. to, right? So that's... So Linda, I feel like this also needs to come out. If we're having one document that's family law, this is not family law. Okay. This is some a recommendation coming out of this subcommittee, but it's not okay. family law. And I think that the issue for me is, is this sufficient for the recommendation or does it need to be built out a little bit with more specificity? Like Fariba, what you said about contacting the agency is a little bit different than what I had thought. I had thought that the paraprofessional would be able to contact the agency. Um, so my, it's just a question, does this need to be built out a little bit more or is this level of detail sufficient? I think that it should be built out a little bit more and I am happy to take this and come back to this group. Thank um, you saying that. <laughs> there's things in there that I would like to see included, including helping a family pre-detention enter into a voluntary agreement with the agency. Never, no in-court representation but guide them so they can avoid detention. That's a great point. That's a great point. We see that a lot, those pre-detention agreements, right. the voluntary, voluntary plans that could really impact the family if it's not worded right. So I 100% agree. Should be taken out, have its own report, just like the um, other areas we've already talked about. And then let's flush it out some more. Happy to help out, let me know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the last category, the last uh, task is this uh, adoptions not arising from a dependency petition, the ones that happen in family court. And I think like uh, one of the things that have been talked about was like step parent adoptions where there's not an issue of terminating parental rights, uh, very straightforward uncontested um, adoption. I was gonna ask Elizabeth. Um, so that's um, very paperwork intensive. So LDAs are doing adoptions, but those, the step parent adoptions, yeah. So not independent petitions for no. non-relative, not other types of adoptions? I don't think so. I don't think they're handling those. Mm -hmm. Because I think those are form intensive too. So I was curious. Another um, category that would fall into like maybe non-contested, not terminating parental rights is the, I think it's called in vitro adoptions. Like when um, you go to the bank to get those. I don't know if you, if that needs to go in there. Yeah, anything IVF, I would strongly encourage us not to include in the paraprofessional services because so complicated. the lobbying group you will get. <laughs> that will come in as a stakeholder. Yeah. Um, yeah, so complicated. Yeah, yeah that, that to me is a very complicated area and is one that could be very detrimental to getting the overall mm -hmm. paraprofessional mm -hmm. plan approved. Yeah. Yep, those. yep, subject to litigation, absolutely. So do we wanna include the step parent adoption? I mean, I've never done one, but I understand that the, it's just just like guardianships, un uncontested guardianships, very paper form intensive. Judicial Council has all the forms. And then we can talk about once it's become contested, like court representation, whether that's a threshold that or not. But what, what do you guys think at the outset? Yeah, I agree. So do we want to spe specify that contested adoptions are not included? I, I think that's a discussion we have to have because okay. it relates to court representation. To me, contested means right. you know now you've got a court case going on and requires court appearance. Mm -hmm. What does everybody okay. else think? 
So yeah, maybe yeah. it's time to talk to the to turn to the discussion about in court representation overall, and then and then we can that can be this this question could be assumed under subsumed under that discussion. So, are we ready to turn to this topic? We have to. Yes. Okay. So, um, and, and I think that Leah had mentioned that at the February meeting, there's going to be an overall, like a facilitated discussion on the topic of in-court representation as a whole. But my understanding is that this subcommittee wants to include in its recommendation to the working group, specific recommendations on this topic, even prior, prior to that facilitated discussion. So maybe we can just start and hear what people have to say about whether there are circumstances in which in court representation. And I think, um, Leah, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that the, the framing of the discussion that's in, intended at the meeting in February is a, an overall policy decision about whether the presumption is that in court representation is allowed and that certain topics will be excluded and unless they're excluded, it will be allowed or the, or the reverse, which is that the, the expectation is that in court representation will not be allowed except for certain specified exceptions. Is that right, Leah? Yes. So, um, so maybe we can start from that, with that question, sort of we do our own little preview of how that discussion is going to go. So if, if someone wants to start on, you know, what, which way you'd be inclined to um, uh, vote or, or weigh in on this topic. I, I think there's a middle one too, which is whether the paraprofessional could sit at council table, but not be appearing in the case, which would be somewhat akin to, but not exactly like the support person that a domestic violence victim is allowed to have sit with them at council table at the restraining order hearing. And I think Justice Petru brought that up too. It's like, there's, it's not a, a bright line at the, at the bar in terms of who can cross that line that maybe they, they could go up and help the people so that the person's not literally look, turning back to the audience and trying to get cues from their paraprofessional. Yeah, either party actually can have one and the role is specified in spam code section 6303. Yeah. So I'm a fan of a hybrid. I, well, I want to put it out there. I want to talk about a hybrid, which is, I like bright run rules myself, so no representation. However, perhaps it would work if the person could have a role, at, could sit at the council table, could help the litigant organize their, their paperwork and maybe, maybe 6303 says support person cannot say anything, but perhaps this person could kind of say, oh yeah, this is, this is that document if they're presenting evidence, so on and so forth, and then be able to answer, participate at the judge's request. I'm just putting it out there. I, I want to talk it out to see if, if that's a viable option, good points, bad points, but kind of like hybrid, none, no representation, representation, sort of these different hybrids in the middle. Linda, could you put up a blank document and maybe take some notes? I think it would be okay. helpful. To sure. Um, and so, can I ask Fariba, what is the, when you think about in-court representation, what is the reason to not allow it? And what would a reason be to allow it? To me, it requires certain um, training and experience that a paraprofessional just going through the paraprofessional training may not get, unless you know the training is going to be involving preparing them for litigation. Um, and it just quick thinking on your feet, really um, reaching into yourself and into your education and pulling out all the knowledge that you have to be able to object and respond to objection and protect your client and you know, answer questions that may come up. Um, and the other is what's, then if, what's the difference between you know, being an attorney licensing to practice law um, and the professional? They can give legal advice and they can do court representation. 
It's just issue limitations then. You know, I like to understand that more. I'm not opposed to it. I like to talk about it. If I can um, chime in. Um, so I think the goal of the paraprofessional program is to, um, you know, help the self-represented individual come up with stipulations to try to stay out of court. So by give, giving us more power behind the scenes to come up with stipulations, to file the correct documents, then um, we'll avoid court altogether, right? Just to sit, I'm thinking a hybrid sit at the council's table is what um, would be best in this situation, maybe not full court representation. Um, it has just been said that, um, you know, it takes a really high level to, to address the judge and, you know, of education. We have 80% of self-represented litigants addressing the judge now with no legal background and they're getting through fine. So um, giving, um, so that's one point. Um, so I would say a hybrid would be the absence of what we're seeing now because we don't have maybe hybrid professionals um, is the court is taking the time to continuously educate the self-represented litigant regarding steps they've taken thus far that may not have been correct, what they need to do moving forward before the next hearing. Um, and so there's a lot, and I know that maybe judge, um, you, you can talk more about it um, because she she says she deals with all of these self-represented individuals in Santa Clara and it's a high docket, like very active. Um, but right now, you know, there she's taking the time to educate them. And so those are my points on that. Thanks. I agree with the hybrid model. I also wanna say that I appreciate the movement that's happened over the past many months, because if I'm remembering correctly, early on, there was a bright line about council table. Um, but I'm also remembering something that struck me many weeks ago that Elizabeth said, which is, we're not going to be able to get away with telling the paraprofessional that they cannot speak in court because the judge is going to look to them and say, <laughs> I see your name here, you know, you helped with this. Could you just answer my question? So having that, you know, some kind of a, a gag against that is not gonna work. So I very much appreciate the movement that's happened here. And I like um, Fariba's uh, stated hybrid example. I, I have to say something here. I think we can't, justify our decision to allow court representation by saying, oh, now self-represented litigants are representing themselves and they're being allowed to and they're doing just fine. I think that's the difference between paying a professional to represent you versus doing the job yourself. And we can't say, oh, then we're going to set the standard lower because look, the self-represented litigants are representing themselves. I don't, I just don't agree with that. I think there's a certain standard a performance that has to be met if you pay somebody to do something for you. And I hope that makes sense. And I always use the medical analogy. You know, you, you, have, you have a little cut, you put a little new spore in, you put a bandit on it, you're good. You need heart surgery, you're not going to go buy a book and perform surgery on yourself. You know what I mean? So, you know, I'm going to hold that doctor to doing a good job. So, um, so I think that we have to differentiate between the two uh, self-represented Litigant, pure self-represented litigant, a, a litigant who's being represented by a paraprofessional and one that's being represented by a licensed attorney with a license to practice law. That's just my opinion. So Steve, Stephen, what do you think about this hybrid model and allowing the paraprofessional to not just sit at council table, but also participate at the request of the judge? You're on mute, Stephen. To answer your question, I really feel tested on this because of the difference between representing a constituency that's 140,000 plus lawyers versus not putting impediments in the way to make the program unsuccessful. I think that 
for me, the uh, for me, it was a bright line about sitting at council table because that would invite questions from judicial officers. I think in the pilot program, that's what I'm really interested to see whether or not the judges sui sponte are asking the paraprofessionals questions or asking them to engage. Um, but the pragmatics of not having that person at the table, it's kind of like, to me, like having a second chair when people have got three lawyers, right? They're handing documents over to the lead attorney who's the only one that should be doing the questioning. So I, I want to get input from the working group as a whole, members that are judicial officers. I'd like to hear Judge Wiley's input on this about whether she would or would not want to ask. I think even if there was a prohibition against asking the paraprofessional questions, I think there's some judicial officers that would do it anyway. And they're creating a potential problem there if they do that. So is it I fair for me right. to say? I think when they, you got a busy guy, oh, sorry. I was saying, is it fair for me to say I'm confused and concerned and not sure I want more input from the judicial officers before I take a final position? Hmm. I, I'm in the same boat. This is Sharon. Oh. Like I, I am not in favor of um, in court representation, but whether or not the paraprofessionals could sit at counsel's table and um, how far they can go, I want more input before I make up my mind. Yeah, I think there's a big potential here for, oh, we say that they can answer questions, but at some point in time, the way that you answer a question is argument. It is the heart and soul of what an attorney does how I answer a judge's question, what information I provide and how I provide it, the sequence I provide it, that's lawyering. And that, that's where I mean, you're, you're gonna denigrate an entire profession if you elevate the perfect professionals to the point where they can do, we may have limits on subject matter, but I could completely function and do what I do right now as a paraprofessional within the bounds of the, the limits that we've put on family law, it wouldn't change my practice, but maybe 1%. And I'd be getting rid of quadros, which I would love to get rid of because they're a giant pain. <laughs> I saw you laughing, Dana. So I, I think we have to maintain a distinction between what is a paraprofessional and what is a lawyer. And to me, it's that in-court work. And again, I really can't see the constituency I represent not vehemently opposing uh, a, a provision that has uh, in court act of representation and or even answering the judge's question. So that, that's where I'm struggling with. Hey, frankly, I'd like to see an internship program for attorneys, a minimum of, I don't know how many hours to practice litigation because that's not easy, you know, to think on your feet, to protect your client by objecting to the right, you know, to the wrong questions that are being asked. It's just, there's that role that's really seminal. And I think when the calendars are, are large, there's a backlog, the judge is running out of time, they will reach out to whoever's sitting at the council table and trying to make the self-represent litigant understand what they're asking or what document they're looking for or clarify their questions. So I think that'll happen. It's just crazy, you know, during the calendar. To anything to make it easier. So I remember um, when we were talking about this, uh, we were talking about the importance of having someone sit at the table with domestic violence um, victims. Um, sometimes other people sitting at the table are interpreters, just wanted to mention that, um, who, who speak um, to the client directly. But um, I don't know if we're if limiting it to just domestic violence, right? I know it, if, you know, in court representation is gonna keep the program from moving forward. I mean, I don't know that we wanna fight that fight as far as um, for paraprofessionals. I don't see paralegals who are currently working at law firms quitting their job and coming to go represent um, people because one, they don't have that business mindset, they're employees. Um, so I don't really see that many people wanting to do in court representation in um, all subject areas, right? In guardianships, or if, if it gets contested, they're gonna pass it on to the attorney referral of the bar association um, or a contact that they have. So I remember we were talking about it more in a domestic violence, the importance of having someone that you didn't leave you at the courthouse doors um, and having that full support at the hearing. 
So maybe limiting it to a specific subject is what I'm thinking. Can I share a screen for a second? Sure, let me stop sharing mine. Go ahead. Okay, so this is the family code section that deals with what the support person can do in a domestic violence case. Um, if they have an attorney, they, they the uh, protected party, and I think it, it goes both ways, right? Because what you commented earlier, okay. The, the support person gets to go sit at council table only if the party's not represented by an attorney. And that's the subsection B. Um, they can go to mediation sessions. They can go to mediation orientation sessions. And just as a side note, in 26 years, I've had to go to five different family court services mediations. Generally speaking, counsel don't go to those unless there's some issue that, that can only be resolved by having counsel present at the mediation. Um, the court has discretion. This is kind of maybe the model It's like subsection E, we'd have to address that because that the court can tell the support person they need to leave when the court believes the person is prompting, swaying, or influencing the party protected by the order, I guess in a negative way. Um, so maybe a, a provision that if the court deems it, it's not mandatory that the court allow the paraprofessional to go to counsel table, but we give them that, that option. And um, I think the question kind of, you know, it would be the same as the interpreter because that's there is a two-step process. If the paraprofessionals up there, they don't need to answer the question. They just need to advise and give legal advice to the party they're assisting how to answer the question that a judge would ask. So I'll stop my share now. I, I, I'm, I'm understanding and appreciating that it'll be far more productive for the court, for the paraprofessional to be next to the party so that they're not running back and forth from the audience, getting documents or getting questions answered and put them in the same position that they would be. But I, I think that I would not allow, unless I hear strong input from the judicial officers on the working group, I would not allow the paraprofessionals to even answer questions, at least in the pilot phase. Have the, have the party do it out, but the paraprofessional would be there to be able to counsel them. So could it be if the judge had a question, then the paraprofessional could advise their client on how to respond to the question? Or would you yeah. not even allow that? No, 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 they should be able to, that's what I'm suggesting is that they're, okay. they're at the council table and they confer and then the, the party themselves gives the response. I can just think, you know, there's not, and it's particularly bad on Zoom. Uh, and we're going to stay on Zoom probably till the end of the year. Will be less of an issue by the time the program gets started. But the the you know you know what the let's say the other side has an attorney. You know what they're going to do while the paraprofessional is trying to answer, and the judge may or may not cut them off. They're going to be interrupting them. They're going to be doing all the bad behavior I see all the time. Do you go in court at all, Fariba? Just as employee of the court, but I have a, yeah, I've observed. Yeah, I mean, there, the, 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 I, I have disciplined myself not to interrupt the other party of the other side when they're talking, but I'm the minority. The norm is you see kind of like this Springer-esque uh, uh, environment play out in family court where, you know, e the parties do it, even the attorneys do it, where they're interrupting saying, well, that's not true. I, I didn't steal the cat. The cat just disappeared, whatever it is, right? And I think that limiting it to the, either the party or a council is important. And I'm really worried that the person who thinks they're getting legal advice from an attorney, but it's really a paraprofessional is gonna be at an even a more disadvantage if their paraprofessional starts getting run over in court by the lawyer on the other side. You know, one of the other reasons to have um the someone sit at the table with them is to just explain in English um, basic language, you know, non legal legalese. So, so they have the language translator, but they also have the 
um, non legal lease language, that's very helpful because like if you go in there and you're representing yourself or you have assistance from a paraprofessional, you're very nervous. You don't know about your surroundings. Um, you know, you're coming in here for a restraining order and whatever you say can or won't extend that restraining order. So you're very nervous and, and you, blew, you forget everything, everything that you've prepped for, everything you're in front, your abuser is on the other side. Um, and so it's very, you, you go numb, you forget everything. So I think having that paraprofessional is very, um, very helpful just to even explain to you what the judge just said. Okay, the judge just told that person that dot, dot, you know, because the individual, not even speaking the language barriers, right? Um, and then you play telephone because then the interpreter needs to send, give it to this person, that kind of thing. Um, so I just wanted to make a point of that. Okay. Trying to find, there's a, there was a, there is Nuno versus California, CSU Bakersfield. Um, the court already has that obligation, whether it fulfills that obligation is questionable or not. But that was a case from April of 2020 where the, co the court in explaining the next status conference and a demur issue was extremely unclear with a self-represented professor. And ultimately the demur that was sustained was reversed because the court had not been clear to him. But that said, the, the parties not having to rely on a judicial officer to explain things would be helpful. So I think I'm open to, and again, this is subject to discussion with the group that I represent, but I think I'm open to the paraprofessional at council table, but not allowed to respond to questions. And if the court finds it unhelpful, the court having the authority to dismiss the paraprofessional from the council table. So a couple of things. First, I'd like us to step back just a little bit and, and forget for a moment that everybody's on Zoom or Teams or Blue Jeans, WebEx, whatever they use right now. Um, I think we need to take a step back. Now, if the uh, litigant is being represented, represented, assisted by a paraprofessional, are they gonna be allowed to, and I was looking at this list and I couldn't find it, I may have overlooked it, but are they allowed to participate in meet and confer discussions prior to the hearing? Yes, no? Um, it's not on our list. No. Okay, a dispute resolution is not on our list and we have to add it. In, in uh, California has a public policy favoring uh, resolving disputes, right? That's number one. Our court has a local rule that the parties have to meet and confer prior to the hearing, unless there's a restraining order and they don't have attorneys, okay? So I think we have to sort of approach it. First of all, have a topic of dispute resolution because that could happen outside. And Elizabeth reminded me of that, you know, working behind the scenes, trying to help the parties resolve disputes, right? So I think we have a separate category for that in our task categories. And then for day of court services, let's call it day of court services, okay? Are they allowed to be there? Number one, be there, present inside the courtroom, forget everybody's remote. So if, if they're allowed to be there, they can also be rem there remotely. Number two, what role can they have outside of the hearing, meet and participating in meet and compare process and directly communicating with the attorney, directly negotiating. And then once the hearing commences and there's no agreement, then what can they do? What can they say? Not just um, directly conferring with the attorney, but directly conferring with the other party who may be self-represented. Absolutely, absolutely. I didn't mean to leave that out, yeah. Um, and then there was something else. Okay, so with regards to 6303E, like being a model of what, rule we come up with, right? I would want it to also be in the positive, that is the court, allowing the court discretion, and I know that may not be popular, I'm just putting it out there, the court discretion to reach out to the paraprofessional who may be present in court if, and we could use language like to facilitate 
the case to clarify something in the interest of justice, something like that. Because I think generally in family law, court is given wide discretion in many, many different areas. Even in child support, where it's pretty much black and white, they still have discretion to deviate as long as you know they meet A, B, C, and D requirements, right? So I think that it would be probably best practice to move towards giving the judge more discretion than limiting their discretion. And then training, massive training will be required to make sure, I mean, here, listen, attorneys don't behave and interrupt you. So massive training will be required if this hybrid, some sort of hybrid is allowed to make sure that paraprofessionals know how to um, behave <laughs> in court. Not that I'm saying they don't. I think that'll be covered. You know, we've got a three unit advocacy program that we're promoting for or addressing in the licensing subcommittee. I think that'll, that's gonna be a big significant part of it. And do you think it should be optional? Like an, if we go that route, okay? Should be optional for path professionals to choose that as a portion of their practice and then they would have to take that train. Elizabeth, I kind of remember you saying in one of our meetings that there are a lot of paraprofessionals, a lot of um, professionals out there that want to take this, become licensed, but they may not want to do everything. They may not want to give uh, uh, appear in court. So should we make them take the additional training for a uh, court appearance? If, yeah, I mean, I think it would, should be like a choice, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of the um, the people who are already helping self-represented litigants feel like they're, well, they have to, they have to work with their hands tied behind their back because they're not able to give legal advice. So I think just being, giving the opportunity to give legal advice is really all they um, probably wanted. Um, a lot of people do not want to um, go to the court with the other person, not even to sit in the bleachers, well, not the bleachers, but like in the galley. Yeah. Um, because you know they're intimidated as well, so I don't see that many people. But but you know, giving them the choice mm -hmm. would be good. It, but remember, there's the whole other group of people who are prospective licensees, who are those who have a JD, who you know maybe didn't pass the bar exams. They may be differently situated in terms of their inclination to go into court. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, Stephen, this kind of ties to the conversation we had in licensing about perhaps looking at ways to um, allow people to waive out of some of the experiential requirements. I mean, the both the experiential and the academic requirements. If court advocacy, which is one of the mandatory um, curricular requirements now, if it became optional based on whether or not you wanted to advocate in court. Back to that. Is that going to be hard to uh, monitor from a from a licensing perspective? That is, you know, it's going to be a li like a little check mark on their card that says this person is allowed to yeah, I... do court representation. Yeah, I mean, I'm imagining that these folks will be, um, you know, licensed by the state bar the way attorneys are, but when you look at the profile online, it will have to specify exactly what they're licensed for. Right, the specialization um, and other details. And so then it's a, an education thing to, to educate prospective clients and the courts to know, to look it up, and then you can see what this person is authorized to do. But that's the only way I see this working. How effective that is, I don't know. But that's, that's what it would have to be. I'm, I'm also looking at this from the client or the consumer standpoint, and I just want to make sure that when they, they go to a paraprofessional and they hire them, that there are very clear disclosures on if you have to go into court, these are the limitations on what the paraprofessional can do and that there are some seamless um, referrals to attorneys if the person wants to and can afford to hire an attorney uh, for that portion of the case. There are gonna be people who can't afford it and they're gonna stick with the paraprofessional and hope for the best. Um, 
you know, especially if they didn't qualify for legal aid or, you know, like um, there are limits on what self-help centers can do. But then there are people who are going to be more in that low bono category who may be able to afford an attorney, an attorney only in limited scope for a portion of the case. And they may want to choose to have the paraprofessional help them to a certain point and then have the attorney represent them in court, especially if the case gets ugly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great suggestion, Sharon. I think um, one of the things that can be done is there's a document that's created the disclosure in both English and Spanish and says, I know that I could have gone elsewhere to get attorney assistance, you know, or all of the disclosures that you want and take it one step further and require that it be filed at the court, right? Um, sometimes, for example, LVAs, if they're going to help a self-represented litigant in Sacramento, Sacramento has a local form that they have to fill out a form that the self-represented litigant is okay that the um, LDA gets copies of filings. So it, something similar is already happening. Um, I would, you know, just so that, and again, if it's English and Spanish, it'd be better um, and file it with the court so that everyone's on the same page. Yeah. And that reminds me of what we're doing in the uh, regulations committee, which we're coming up with uh, the contract language and uh, disclosures and informed consent. And I was exactly thinking the same thing, that this could be one of the items that has to be in, this, in terms of scope of representation, but also something about you can check what I can and cannot do at calbar.org better language than that, but you know, something like that. And in terms of filing it in court, I could totally see that if a paraprofessional is not within the scope of their duties to represent the person in court, there could be a notice of limited scope representation filed in those cases and the paraprofessional is not allowed to represent this person in court. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we can assume, you know, paraprofessional will uh, not choose that specialty, but do it anyway, but just in case we want from a consumer protection standpoint. And I don't know if the court, unless, at least in our system, unless we flag something for the judge, like there's a DV restraining order in here or something like that, where the judge would have to know at every hearing, I don't think there's a court will look in the file to find that notice of limit scope representation. I know that it's beyond the scope of, of this committee and, and this conversation, but I would love a program like this to like, even though we haven't fully discussed whether um, attorneys are gonna be supervising and I can anticipate that a lot of these paraprofessionals are gonna be working on their own and hanging out their own shingle, but wherever it's possible for paraprofessionals to have a direct tie to attorneys um, for referrals, for situations like this. So it's more seamless for the client if a paraprofessional has to hand off a case for purposes of a messy, um, a messy case in court representation situation, which is gonna be a lot of cases. We were just talking about that in regulation, right, Farifa, with our rules discussion. The nature of the relationship. Yeah, we were. We were professionals with each other and with attorneys. Right. So I don't know, Sharon, do you mean that to have a specific attorney identified as the relationship between the client and paraprofessional starts where the where a certain attorney is named in their contract saying if this case becomes complicated or if you need services in areas that I do not have a specialization such as court representation, I will be referring the case to this attorney. Is that what you meant, Sharon? Um, you know, I haven't thought that far, oh. but um, just having those, you know, whether it's formalized or informal ties, having these paraprofessionals have attorneys that they regularly work with for, for these purposes. Um. Um, yeah. Linda, I see Judge Wiley and the attendees. Oh, okay. The panelist. Yes, I will do that. Since I know we've been waiting for a judicial voice on this topic. Great. Thanks for calling that to my attention. I kept looking and didn't see her before. So thank you. 
Thank you, and my apologies to everyone uh, for being late. Well, you're the woman of the hour. We've been oh, fantastic. In court representation. What can I help with? Well, one of the uh, subcommittee members, if you could bring Judge Wiley up to speed and then on the discussion. Well, well, go ahead, Steve. It's okay. We're discussing several different phases, whether they're allowed to be in court and sit at council table, but not answer questions directly posited by the court versus they're in court and they're able to sit at council table uh, but not authorized to answer questions from the court. And under either scenario, if the court finds that the paraprofessional is frustrating the process that the court, like a domestic violence advocate, would be able to ask for the paraprofessional to remove themselves from counsel table. So, so these are my initial thoughts. Um, you know, we have, as you mentioned, with domestic violence cases, we often have support people who are there in court who come with the uh, domestic violence survivor and answer questions um, if there is a pro some part of the process that needs to be further explained. Sometimes they will go into the hallway and explain that process. And I've often found them extremely helpful. So the nature of that relationship is slightly different from the relationship that a paraprofessional uh, will have because the paraprofessional will be the person who you know, has helped uh, prepare documents uh, for the client who has perhaps discussed strategy for the hearing with the client um, and who has certainly a much deeper relationship uh, with that individual. So I, I do believe that um, certainly they should be allowed to sit at council table. Um, I do believe that they should be allowed to communicate with their clients. Um, in terms of advocating, I think that that's to me where you, you, know, you have a little bit broader part of the discussion uh, in terms of whether you allow them um, to advocate uh, on behalf of the client during the court proceeding. Um, but the other two issues, uh, I think, in my mind, uh, are, are easily answerable. Uh, and certainly, if they are disruptive and or uh, proving to be uh, a barrier to the proceedings, then certainly they should be and can be removed. So I focus, I focus the issue a little bit on um, should they be allowed uh, to offer argument? And that's where the constituents we I represent, I know is gonna adamantly oppose that. Um, and that has not been presented to them as a vote because it's not been addressed definitively yet by either the subgroup or the working group. But I think that's, that's a line that I know from my constituency, the California Lawyers Association, that, that they would, that's not gonna pass. At least they will, they will vigorously oppose that. And we don't necessarily make decisions based on anticipated opposition, I'm aware of that. But I do don't wanna also ignore it either. And I think if we allow advocacy by a paraprofessional, we are not blurring the line, we're eliminating the line between paraprofessionals and lawyers. I mentioned before you got on Judge Wiley, I, I could see myself, I think the dues are gonna be lower. I could switch to being a paraprofessional and give up my law license and probably have you know a more efficient practice, but it wouldn't change my rates in all likelihood. But I think, and, and that's why I think it's a very practical issue that we're looking at um, just in terms of, and I just realized I had not started my video. Here we are, um, my apologies. That's why I think it's it's a very practical issue This the paraprofessional should be allowed uh, to support the client in, in the hearing, in the proceedings. Um, they can, let's say, you know, the, the hearing for some reason uh, is going sideways, if you will. They should be allowed to, to tell the client, ask the court for a recess, let's take a break so I can go outside and we can talk further. All of that, I think, is, is well in keeping with what we're trying to do here in, in bridging this gap. Um, so, as I said, again, I think the, those issues um, to me are no brainers. The other moving towards uh, advocacy, you know, certainly that'll be a broader and deeper discussion. Mm -hmm. And Judge, um, hello, how are you? Mm -hmm. um, so we, um, I also agree with um, 
Steve's point about blurring the line and, and the hybrid, uh, for me, seems to present a, you know, good, good uh, balance uh, to be discussed, of course, at the uh, further. But one of the um, ideas that Steve had was kind of looking at uh, 6303E, the language there, where it uh, uh, prescribes what the court can do in terms of uh, excluding the support, DV support the person. 6303 covers DV support persons, excluding the DV support persons from the hearing, you know, basically bad behavior. And um, I like that in terms of, ex to the extent that we could do that because we don't do that for, I don't know if we do that for attorneys right now. I suppose the judge has the discretion to throw their attorney outside the courtroom if they're being disrupted. But, I like to see also a positive in there where, and we've been discussing that, where the court is given discretion to reach out to the paraprofessional um, where the self-represented litigant is not uh, understanding something, is not answering the question correctly. What do you think about giving the court that discretion? So, so two, well, two, two points I want to make. Um, first, uh, CCP 128 is kind of a catch-all for proceedings and, and allows the court discretion with respect to um, how proceedings uh, take place and the manner in which they take place. So I think that that would also allow a court to exclude um, anyone from the proceedings. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to um, allowing the uh, paraprofessional um, to help if there is an issue, I, I, I think that that is a would happen anyway, whether it's written in a statute or not. I think that, you know, as a practical matter, I think judges understand kind of the overwhelming nature at times of the proceedings. And it, I think more sensitive judges would certainly seeing that there was an issue, ask for a recess, call for a break and allow the paraprofessional to, to talk with uh, with the client. I think that, uh, again, more sensitive judges would, would certainly engage with the paraprofessional um, to see if there was something that the client needed to understand. Um, so I think that, that having that, I, I think, would certainly be codifying what, what I believe judges, uh, particularly good judges, would do uh, in a real life situation if there was an issue with, with the litigant. Thank you. Are you, let's say that they're sitting at council table, Judge Wiley, and you've got a question. Do you think it's feasible or practical for you to direct your question to the client or the party as opposed to the paraprofessional? Or are you going to want to bypass the party and go straight to their paraprofessional? I think it depends on the question. Is it a, is it a question that I want um, the client under oath to answer? Uh, based upon their personal knowledge, or is it a, a process question that I believe that the paraprofessional may have uh, more insight into? Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it depends because there are times, certainly in family law, that we directly ask clients questions even when they're represented by attorneys. And that happens all the time. Yes. So I think it really de definitely depends on the question. But you know, I think the, the bonus is that you, you, you have a paraprofessional and you have someone, again, who's been intimately involved in the case that you now have as you know someone who is available to you um, to try to help you get the information that you may need to make a ruling. Well, one of my concerns was to me that's what throws into advocacy is if you are putting the paraprofessional in a position of responding to a judicial officer's questions, there's so much lawyering and tactics to go into how I would respond to a question from a judge. I, I'm very concerned about, again, that line being a race between paraprofessional and lawyer and, and whether that we're allowing them to do something that they shouldn't do, not because it wouldn't help the court. I think, you know, there could be a situation where grandma's out in the audience and you've got a question about child care that's been going on, that's been providing by, by grandma and grandpa, and your inclination would be to go and ask them questions. But, you know, they're, if they're not having been called as a witness, there's a limitation on that. That's when you say, I'd like you to step forward, please have, you know, before you sit down, please raise your right hand. 
And, yeah. and I think one of the things that I, I, I want to kind of emphasize is what you said is help the court. You know, this is all, this whole process seemingly should be designed to help the court ascertain the truth of facts. And so absolutely, if there's some information that we can and should develop in the courtroom, um, then I think it's the judge's discretion to be able to do that using, you know, whatever tools and or witnesses they have available to them. And that's where I think there has to be a line between advocacy and the court just wanting to move the mail. And when the and, and the court is going to be the one that enforces the no advocacy if that's where we end up. But when the court has a question about process or don't you have document X, Y, and Z, and the paraprofessional is jumping up and down in their chair to have a rule that says, if the court says, I can see that you, you want to answer my question and they're not allowed to respond, I don't see how that works. And I don't see how it helps the court move the mail. So they're allowed to respond to questions directed at them by the court, but otherwise not allowed to participate in the proceeding. And the questions need to be procedural questions, not, uh, I don't know how to characterize right, but tactical questions. In other words, they, the court shouldn't use questions to elicit argument from this from the paraprofessional. Does that make sense? But I think it, it makes sense to me, but, but you know, in a real life situation, when you have a, a judge who's directing a question at a paraprofessional, you're asking that paraprofessional then to be responsible for parsing out, well, is this a procedural question or is this a tactical question? And I think that that's, that's going to prove impossible to do. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it seems like an important component will be providing education to the judges, uh, you know, through the judicial council, presumably, about this new newly licensed professional and the role that they can play in, and how they the court can use them to their benefit. I agree. I think, you know, you, you can certainly have a rule, no advocacy. And, you know, whereas the court, a judge may understand what that means. Again, when you get into a real life situation, I don't think the onus should be on the paraprofessional to figure out whether something is advocacy versus, uh, you know, something else. So I absolutely think that there, there does need to be some educational proponent component for this. And I do think a lot of this we're going to figure out during the pilot program too. If we are frustrating judicial officers because we're limiting what the paraprofessionals do, or we're making matters more difficult because the paraprofessionals participating, we're going to have that data and that information. So does it seem like we're leaning towards option two of what I have here? Yes, with, with another subclass that says questions have to be directed towards procedure. Uh, something that says it's it's responding to questions but not arguing the matter. But like I said, every time I answer a question I, from a judge, I'm arguing the matter. I'm gonna answer it in a way, I'm gonna be responsive to the judicial officer, but also frame it in terms of frame my answer in such a way to promote the argument that I've already been making. That's where you get paid the big bucks, Stephen. <laughs> it's just I'm, I'm just a simple, <laughs> I'm just a simple lawyer from a from a rural area, Leah. <laughs> that does that capture what you want to say? Yes. Okay. Boy. I'm not looking forward to my meetings coming up with my constituency. And do we want to leave in um, this C that there would be some paraprofessionals that would be authorized to uh, sit at council table and some that shouldn't? Or is it going to be that everyone will be allowed this? I thought that we, well, 
I think the meet and confer and the dispute resolutions before the courtroom, Linda, and I thought that we had addressed this within family law that we did say that they would be allowed to. No, I, I'm sorry. I was referring to C here, this, oh. this requiring specific uh, training and certification. Whether but this- right the, now, there is, the three units of court advocacy is a general requirement for everybody under the current okay. licensure. Right. Program. So, so that's what I'm wondering if we one at one point you Leah you had suggested maybe making this optional and and thereby making that educational requirement optional. So do we want to do that or do we want to assume that everyone is going to do the Can I jump in, Leah? advocacy? Mm -hmm. I think it depends on what endorsement they want. If they want the family law endorsement, which includes the ability to go sit at council table with their client, they have to do the advocacy program. Anybody that's going to do collateral criminal and potentially be in a courtroom needs to be, so it's going to be based on the endorsement that they want. And if we're okay. talking about the pilot program, housing and uh, family law, I think both of those endorsements have to have the, the, in, the advocacy education. I think that uh, as long as it doesn't make a difference in the fee they have to pay and the education they have to take, then it wouldn't matter. You would add it as a specialty if there's an additional, for example, additional fee or additional units of education they have to take to earn that kind of the permission authorization to engage in that part of their practice. And, and then call it something else though, other than advocacy, because it's confusing. We're not allowing them to advocate. So maybe we could call it in court procedures or protocols or how to behave. And the other, sensitive word, Stephen, I'm wondering about for you is, I don't think we should call this representation. And words matter. And I think that word is gonna be very triggering for people who don't want them beyond the bar, right? Um, and then we come up with an, or we, appearance, in court appearance. Something like that, that could be put on whatever paperwork is filed. Fariba, you said limited scope representation, but I still think that word is going to be triggering. Oh, I was just uh, modeling that after limited scope representation rules for attorneys. It could be anything and I agree with you. I think appearance is used with attorneys a lot too. I think perhaps in court presence or in court participation. Presence I think has sort of a connotation of being silent Perhaps participation could then capture both presence and, you know, some kind of a role, limited role. What about in court services? Yeah. A little bit too close to family court services. <laughs> <laughs> what about in court support? What? Support. In court support. Yeah. I, I think that's it. good. I like it. Which is the you don't hate it. <laughs> what about um, in court assistance? No, take services out, honest to God. They will confuse it with family court services. I like it. Good job, Leah. Oh, was that you, Leah? Was that yours? I love it, Leah. Is That's it why she gets perfect? Paid bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then to the, to now to number three, this sort of the dispute resolution topic that meet and confer and pre court. Assistance. I think that was too. That's going to be by endorsement too, as to whether they're going to be getting on the phone with. I mean, I've already got. I got one case that I actually had to have checked because I thought the paralegal was going beyond the scope of what they should be doing and directing letters. But when we checked with the state bar, they said no, that was okay because they can assist counsel. So this is already something I think existing paraprofessionals are doing. Yeah, there are no court rules regarding who can mediate. I yeah. think that we should include that as a topic in our family law project list. And I don't know about the other areas of law and whether you know they're going to be allowed to participate as ADR professionals. But I would think that day of court services are different than out, outside of court services. A dispute resolution can happen and I think Elizabeth was just talking about that, how behind the scenes, they start dispute resolution efforts with the other party. So I think that's a separate thing. When we're talking about in-court support, I think maybe we wanna just say day of court support for 
and then in court would be part of it and then meet and confer would be the other part of it because well right now everything is remote so i don't think this is happening necessarily on the day of the hearing it I think attorneys are meeting and conferring and Stephen, you can tell me before their hearing data arrives because they're no longer in the hallway outside of the courtroom pocket, That's right? right? That's why fewer cases are settling because we're not sitting there, the people aren't being exposed to the court environment and having that rude awakening about what it's gonna be like if they wanna litigate all aspects of their dissolution. Right, so I think we should allow, so right now there's no statutes regulating who can be an alternate dispute resolution professional. I, I think I'm still right on this. So do we need to even put it in there? I, I think it's best practice. I'm answering my own question and leaving it open. I think it's best practice to put it in there because we recognize it as a task that the paraprofessionals should be allowed to do. You know, I've seen some really good agreements come out of L, uh, prepared by LDAs. And um, anyway, so that's anytime. The meet and confer is specifically for the day of the hearing. So um, I, I, I'm assuming you're seeing that I put back the list of tasks. Can you see that now? So. Is there something in addition to this? It sounds like you're talking about besides the day of court services. So this is just pre, you know, mediation or? Uh, actually, we shouldn't call it mediation even though it's type of mediation because that, again, people confuse it with the mediation that goes on at family court services for, because right. I think it's alternative or, or you can call it conflict resolution. I don't know if Elizabeth has a suggestion. I keep putting Elizabeth on the spot, but she's our. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. Well, overall. Was... I was wondering if we need to um, spell out settlement negotiations, right? Like um, a, a role for this where. Um, the person would be able to send a settlement proposal to the other side. Is that something that needs to be spelled out? What are the parameters regarding that? Actually, I really like that. How about this dispute resolution or conflict resolution or, or alternate dispute resolution? And then one would be settlement negotiations, which would capture just overall settlement efforts between the paraprofessional on the other side, whether it's an attorney on the other side or a or, or a self-represented litigant. And the second portion of that would be the day of court meet and confer. So like, so like this then? Yeah, I would so, say um, day of court meet and confer. Take out services and take out the hyphen. Day of court meet and confer. Sediment, sediment, Efforts, you mean? It should be efforts instead of offers? Yeah, I think it's efforts. But what okay. it, Yeah, Elizabeth, does that make sense? Offers, negotiations, the back and forth. Discussions. So, so just said about settlement negotiations? Dis discussions or negotiations, I think, would be, would be encompassing. OK. And I think there should be qualifier except for areas excluded herein, right, Steve? Say that one more time. Except for the areas excluded herein or, 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 or issues, like they cannot negotiate division of a retirement plan or can't. Right, right. Excluded from practice. Yeah. Yeah, or above, that works. Okay. So, um, so I'm gonna go back, I'm sorry to, 
this other document just to make sure that I've actually. Linda, before you leave this one, can you put included after day of court meet and confer? Oh, I, I had it included for the whole thing. Oh, I so see. I can, I just, oh, I just, I'll okay. just move this down. Got it. All right, I can do it that way. Okay, so we're going to go with, it sounds like with this, uh, the recommendation is going to, is, is this number two? Is that correct? Is there a consensus on that? Can I make my consensus conditional until I talk to my higher ups? That, that's where I think we're at, but I need to have a conversation. But I expect that's going to be the recommendation from this group. As, as long as we're not putting it to a vote today, let me put it that way. Okay. You need to employ some advocacy, Stephen. I will. <laughs> um, I, I think that I, I think that I've been very, if not neutral, but open to a lot of this. And that if you if you put this to a, the, the general attorney who's not following this, the idea that this program is even going to happen is is abhorrent to them, right? That's the knee jerk reaction. So that's the problem. I'm just kind of envisioning the aftermath, not so much with the boards that I deal with, but but the general attorney that's out there that when they find out that this is passed because they're not tracking it. Because guess who's gonna get all that angry email? <laughs> There's gonna be a backlash, yeah. Steven. Yeah. I know. I'll put my big boy pants on. <laughs> yeah, for one, really appreciate how thoughtful you're being about it, given what I know is a, a lot of pressure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Leah. Yes. Okay, so we're hoping at the next meeting that we'll have um, recommendations from this, the subject matter experts on the conservatorship and guardianship topics. And I think so, and we've got Dana who's agreed to take up dependency and we right. need to, to still deal, I think, with adoption and the non-family violence protection. When I say adoption, I think we've decided on step-parent adoption to be included, right. but I just don't know that it's, it, I think it needs to be further delineated. Um, so we need to find people that do that work to assist in that. So if any of you on this. I can nominate myself for the step parent adoption. You're saying break out the list of what. Yes, yeah, yeah, so all the steps that are involved. I okay. can do that. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Bree, were you gonna say something? Were you interested in also regular adoption or are we, have we decided to limit it to step parent adoption? I think, and we're talking about uncontested. Right. Step parent adoption now. I thought you said step parent, but I, I don't I don't recall. There are regular adoptions too, and, and I'm I think some non-lawyers do those forms. As I'm sitting here, I can't think of the specifically who, but I it may be worth taking a look at it. Now we don't do adoptions here, so I don't have any subject matter experts in my office, but Stephen. I was just wondering, now everybody's busy and everything, but remember Lucy, she was on Flexcom. I forget her name. She was from an agency in Southern California. The agency was um, Buha, Harriet Buhai Center, I think, they, that she handled there. Lucy, I forget her name. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She's no longer as associated with, with uh, MAGRA. ACAL, I think ACAL's current representative might be Robert Walmsley, who's an attorney in Santa Barbara County. I'd have to go and check with Steve Montagna to find out who that is, who's currently manning that. I was just wondering if we could sort of get a hold of an expert to to help us kind of figure out if regular adoptions would be appropriate to include here too. Uh, they are form intensive, just like step back. So, 
let me see if I can figure out, let me send an email to see if I can figure out who it is. I may connect you, Linda, with somebody that's associated with the uh, Family Law Executive Committee to speak to the issue. I, I will tell you when I had my bill that ultimately died last year, that was to uh, make paternity matters non-confidential. They were one of the most vocal and most difficult groups to get my bill around, even though it was not an adoption bill per se, it was just a paternity right. bill and access to the records. Okay. And then, uh, so we'll still need to find someone, Linda, for the remaining protective orders. Right. Oh, we have someone with their hand up, Ira. Do you want... Maybe Ira's going to volunteer for something. Hold on a second. Let me uh, get to that. Okay. Hi, Ira. Hi. No, I don't volunteer for nothing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, I had a, uh, a, a reaction to the part where it says uh, that the judge can exclude the uh, uh, paraprofessional. Uh, it seemed to me that that needs to be more limited because it's like the judge excluding somebody's attorney of record. It's like that. It's not exactly the same, of course. So uh, it's I think that's different from just excluding the judge's right to exclude uh, people in general from the courtroom. I think Judge Wiley mentioned CCP 128 takes care of that, so we no longer have to even address it. Well, right? Well, uh, CCP 128 is broad enough to cover it, but. Uh, um, that statute doesn't mean that the judge can, uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain it doesn't mean that a judge can uh, exclude somebody's attorney of record uh, under the same test as whether they could exclude somebody else, anybody else. So Ira, what I'm going to recommend, we're going to be talking about this at the February full working group meeting. Um, this being in court representation, generally family law will be bringing forward its specific recommendation. So why don't we make sure Linda captures your comment? Okay. And if the subcommittee wants to take it up at its next meeting, you, you all can, or we can take it up with the full working group. Uh, fine. These are, I try to attend, I just want to say to everybody on this, um, I try to attend the family law ones in particular, because they're, they're, they're really good ones. And, uh, <laughs> and also, I, I agree with what uh, Stephen said. He's, he's subject to all this pressure. I didn't realize that. Um, but I agree with uh, what Leah said about uh, Stephen. Your comments were really thoughtful and helpful, um, uh, especially in view of the uh, pressure you, that you're describing. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Take care.